We've begun learning about the specific groups on the periodic table, and we've been learning about groups with different levels of reactivity. As we've learned about metals, we learned about the alkali metals, which have that one electron far away from the nucleus that's really unstable, that gets violently ripped away, that makes the alkali metals extremely reactive. The alkaline earth metals have two electrons far away from the nucleus, so they're a step down in reactivity. The transition metals share several electrons and have unpredictable amounts that they can gain or lose. In this lesson, we're going to learn about a group of metals that is unreactive, but also has a very predictable amount of electrons that they gain or lose. We're going to be learning about the rare earth metals. Now, when you hear the word rare, you probably think that these are going to be metals that are scarce, that you don't find everywhere on the earth. Nothing could be further from the truth. These were once thought to be rare, scarce metals that there aren't a lot of in nature. However, we've discovered that they're all over the place. They're just very difficult to isolate, to purify. And as we learn about the rare earth metals, pay attention to why it is that they're so difficult to purify from one another. Here's our picture of the periodic table that we've been using to identify where the different groups are located. But what we haven't done yet is we haven't explored this section of the periodic table. There's a section of elements that's actually located beneath a traditional periodic table. And that section actually should wedge itself in between the alkaline earth metals and the transition metals. The reason why it's offset on the bottom is just to save space so the table doesn't have to be really, really long. We're going to be learning about a group of elements in that bottom section, though, called the rare earth elements. And it's actually the top row of the bottom section. And I'm going to pull up four of those atoms for us to explore more carefully. From left to right, lanthanum cerium, praseodymium, and neodymium. Now, you'll notice as you look at these atoms that they all have really big nuclei. There's lots of protons and neutrons, and therefore there's also a lot of electrons around the outside. That's one of the characteristics of these elements. They all are very big as far as atomic mass goes and as far as their total number of electrons. But there are some patterns in how these elements behave and how they are structured. First off, all of these elements have three electrons that would be considered an unstable distance from the nucleus. They're far away from the nucleus that they're going to participate in making those metallic bonds that we've talked about. And those are the ones that can participate in causing these atoms to form ions. When these atoms do form ions, most of them just lose three electrons to make three plus ions. In fact, all of them can lose three. It's just that some of them can lose other numbers as well. Some can lose two, some can lose four. All of them though are capable of forming these three plus ions that you see. And here's what that causes. Because they all form the same ion, they are all very similar to one another. Because the charge of all of the rare earth elements tends to be the same, they're very similar in properties, and therefore, they're difficult to separate from one another. They're fairly unreactive, so we can't really use their chemical reactivity easily to separate one from another. They have extremely high melting and boiling points, and they're basically the same, so it's difficult to separate them by melting them down. They have the same properties that all metals have. They're all conductive, they are shiny, and because of all of this, because these metals generally behave the same way as one another, essentially, it's very difficult to separate them. It's important for you to realize that the rare earth metals are very difficult to isolate from one another. Now, does that mean that they all do the exact same things? Not at all. The rare earth elements do have a uniqueness for each one of them that makes them very useful in very specialized applications. Some of them are used to make really strong magnets. Some of them are used to make color pigments in televisions, to make the tinting on welding masks. They're used in the manufacture of green technologies like wind turbines. 
or to make different components in your cell phone or computer that actually require the properties of the rare earth elements to make. So these rare earth elements have different properties and several of them are very, very important for industries, but they're very expensive because it's difficult to get them to let go of one another when they're found in nature together. That's what makes the rare earth elements behave the way that they do. They have very, very similar properties because they all form the exact same kind of ion and they behave like very strongly bonded metals.